Hello and welcome to The Second Look, a chance to have an extended chat about what's going on at AFC Bournemouth after that 3-1 loss to Reading on Friday night, and it wasn't pretty. This show forms part of an extended audio download, which can be found on your favourite podcast app. Just search for Back of the Net Bournemouth to download it, and whilst you're at it, why not leave us five stars? Let's get started then, and I'm pleased to bring in podcast host extraordinaire, Jeff Hayward. <laughs> Jeff, how are you doing, buddy? Well, it's been an up and down week, hasn't it? Yeah, lots to unpick, definitely. Mm, yeah. And uh, I've also got Tom Jordan hiding back there. How are you doing, Tom? You okay? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks. Cheers. Not too bad. And uh, we couldn't do this without him. It's the pod regular, Neil Dawson. How's it going, Neil? I'm getting over it. I'm getting there. Try and be positive, chaps, where we can. We can't always. Uh, so, Reading's 3-1 uh, win against us on Friday night. We won't dissect it chronologically and, and pull it all apart minute by minute, but um, so we don't think anyone wants to listen to that. Obviously, there, there are obvious problems on the pitch at the moment, and this podcast aims to explore them. So, Jeff, sometimes it's not the result, but the manner of the performance. What went wrong? Another game of two halves for a start. And um, I think if we're being consistent this season, it's in being inconsistent. And we showed it again. First half, I thought we were awful. It was it was worse than Derby, which was, which was hard to achieve. Second half was much better. Um, but watching the game again... Uh, the conclusion you can draw from watching that is that certain players are just not fighting as a team or for the team even and and we can't we can't go onto a pitch against a team like Reading who are up for it with 60% of the players being up for it on our side. No, I think you're right, Jeff. It looks like a lack of desire. But what, Neil, is creating the lack of desire, do you think? Um, well, I don't know. I think it's a combination of a few things. I think you've potentially got a couple of players that wish they were somewhere else. And it's always hard to... Um, it's always hard once you've mentally left a club to, uh, to fight for it. I think uh, I'm not convinced that uh, Jason's getting the tune out of them that he should in terms of desire um i don't know i don't know necessarily why that is um i always worry when assistants step up because i think they have a different relationship with players um and uh he would have been the one that they kind of would have gone to and he would have been the go between you know between the players and eddie and i think it's really difficult um if you were to be fair to him to step up and uh, uh, and create that desire because i think eddie would have put the absolute um this is the level of performance I expected. And Jason would have done more of the arm round. Um, and quite a few people that we've had on the podcast um, that inside the club have said that's, you know, that's the role that he, he played. Um, so perhaps they haven't quite got that, what a Diana Cross um, element as well, as long with a few of them wanting not to be here. Yeah. And Tom, you and I both, when Jason got appointed, we were quite vocal in, in agreeing that we thought it was, a good move in terms of creating some kind of continuity, but um, there's a lot of people who are now, who said that then, are now are now feeling differently. What do you think? How long do you think Jason's got now with these? If the performances carry on, it's a difficult one, really. Um, he's probably. I mean, I, I don't see them um, kind of putting the trigger. Uh, I think they'll give him the season, um, regardless. I. I I agree. I, I think that the I, what I liked about it was the continuity side of things. Um, losing Eddie rather than on his own, rather than losing everyone, if you like, that was kind of the reason I remained positive. But I appreciate that there's no managerial CV there, like um, Neil alluded to. He's got a certain relationship with the players already. Maybe that's not not working now. But um, yeah, it's it's difficult to to say he's doing a good job at the moment because of the recent form, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, it's it's a strange one. I mean, the, the the people that employed him knew his managerial or lack of managerial CV before employing him. So, you know, nothing should come as too much of a surprise. Um, but at the moment, the players that in some degree let Eddie down um, after the lockdown and when we unfortunately got relegated, 
seemed to be doing the same thing and going through the motions. I, I said on the free throw afterwards that it felt like very similar to some of them games we had behind closed doors when we got relegated, where we didn't need any motivation. It was there in black and white how much the game meant. Mm. And it didn't seem to come across on the pitch. And the players, we know the quality they've got, but it just feels like they're going through the motions and almost just going out there and thinking, well, someone will do something in a minute because we're too good. We'll get a goal in a minute. And um, Reading done the complete opposite. And there's um, a lot to be said for hard work, desire and fight along with the technical ability. And we're just not seeing it at the moment. It's, uh, it's a real concern. We all like the idea of continuity, Teagues. But continuity in the crapness we saw in some of those games last season is not what I wanted. No. No, I can see that. And I, I know, Neil, you... you you weren't sure. In fact, you were you were quite sure that you weren't sure uh, on on that that as a direction to go. Um, do you think we've we've made a big mistake now? Have we have we missed the boat to get a, a fresh voice in? So I didn't I didn't think Jason ever struck me as a manager, and I know people that have played or spoke to people that have played and that, that said similar things. So that was that was my concern. If you ally that with the fact that we clearly needed a big change. Uh, I would have I would have kept Eddie because I think he he earned the right to maybe make that change himself, and I think he's talented enough to have made that change. Um, but once you, we decided we weren't keeping Eddie, or he decided he wasn't staying, whatever happened, then it had to to me we had to then think right. Well, we we can't do continuity. We've got to go elsewhere, uh, and, and and also not to interview. Um, for it there was because there was no proper interview process no one else was looked at it was a lazy lazy appointment i think by a chief exec that just wanted to keep the whole gravy train of friend circle going that that, that i think's afflicted us for um for quite a while so i mean that that was the reason you know that i was dead against it i've not seen much to change my mind since um have we missed the boat uh not not yet no because we're in a playoff spot and we've we've got a we've got a squad that should win the playoffs um if they get into it um we've got because it's a phenomenal squad and it's been added to uh, so no i think you, we could make a, we could make a change now uh, i think we would be we fine but we'd have to make it quickly uh, and i think what we'll find is this squad is so good that they'll win some of the games coming up um but that's not our issue our issue is they've got to go up not that they can beat sheffield wednesday none of us will be surprised if we go and beat sheffield wednesday on tuesday but it doesn't really fix the ability to play against the top sides and beat them that we're going to need to get back in the Premier League and we have to do it this year because of the parachute payments. Where Where is the malaise though Neil? Where do you think it is? I mean it, it, it strikes me a lot of it is down to the attitude of the players. They were fragile last year in key games. We're seeing that again this year. Yeah. You What, what Jason is now faced with is and what you can see he's doing is he's rebuilding the squad with mentally stronger players, right? But trying to do that mid-season while we're trying to go for promotion, I mean, yeah, Pierce, Pearson's got to play on Tuesday night instead of Lerma or Billing. I mean, he's yeah. got to play. You Then you think, well, you've got to start Wilshire. So then you're playing three people in midfield who've never played together before. Mm -hmm. and, and, it where does it work? How does it oh, and also, if you were to ask any fan um, what positions we needed to improve, um, central midfield would have been probably the last of those positions because we, we've we got, as well as Lerma, Cook, Billing, um, we've got uh, uh, Jack Wilshire, obviously, we've got Dan Gosling, um, who it looks like, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about him in a minute. We, 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 we The centre midfield was not the issue. We patently don't have a left back um, and we patently... Uh, even if you think Solanke is good enough to play week in, week out, and for me, the jury's still out on that, we haven't got cover. We haven't got quality cover for Solanke. So we needed a centre forward and we needed a left back. And we probably were best stocked in central midfielder. And we've gone out and signed two central midfielders, which to me is, again, just sets alarm bells as to chief exec and manager's ability to do the jobs that they're paid to do. Yeah, and we're, we're now looking at Dan Gosling probably... Well, no, most certainly we know now is on his way. Tom, he's somebody who always gave us fight. Jason's looking for fight. What's going on there, do you think? I'm very puzzled by what I saw, to be honest. Um, I think I could almost 
understand if we potentially, you know, try to get ourselves obviously back up at the first attempt and then try to maybe rebuild a, a newer team back in the Premier League. To do it when we're trying to fight seems odd in the terms of what I mean is obviously Daniels, another player that, that was obviously let go, you know, Francis Sermon um, and now Dan Goslin and the timing seems odd. It's the other night and the last few performances. We all know the quality of players we've got. We all know we've we've probably got the best squad in the league. The last few performances, it's been where's that fight? Where's that desire? Where's the character? Where's the will to win? And we've just let a player go who epitomises all of those things. And not only that, he's gone to a direct promotion rival. Mm. Um, it seems absolute madness to me. It really does. I, I appreciate that once he's out of contract at the end of the season. So once we potentially say, you know, we're not going to keep you here, we can't probably stop the team he then talks to. So we probably didn't allow him to talk to Watford. He was just open to talk to anyone. But we shouldn't have given that, that an option. You, we're not we're going to get minimal amount of money. You tell Dan Goslin stay to the end of the season and fuck because he would have put in the graft. And after the last, everyone's telling me about the you know the technical quality we've got ahead of him, which I agree with. We've just said about the central midfield area. But I tell you what, after the other night, you get my team at the moment. Just just at the moment, when you're in a bad patch, you need a character like Dan Goslin and um, to strengthen a rival and to to get rid of someone who you can rely on when that's what we're missing at the moment. Yeah, it's yes, yeah, concerned me a lot. I've got to say, and I'm really surprised by that one. Puts a lot of pressure on Pearson coming into that midfield. I mean, boy, you know, I don't think he bargained for for coming into a, a a team that's struggling, where he's where he's really got to hit the ground running um, and be a leader, and and that is where I think this team lacks something it's in leadership and you know tom's right gosling was one of the few people you'd, you'd think yeah you know he leads by example and you can see he gives his 100 percent heart and soul on the pitch every game um so i, I don't get the we we need the people with winning mentalities and then we ship one out to our promotion rivals Makes well sense. that's what i was going to say after the, the the reading game um jason openly come out and said we're probably missing a few leaders, winning mentality, experience. And a few days later, we let Dan Gosling go to Watford. Uh, that, that, to me, makes makes no sense. It makes no sense. Um, and like I say, we're not getting, it's not, uh, you know, we're not getting £20 million. Do you know what I mean? It's not in yeah. the grand scheme of things. Um, it seems like a no-brainer to me to just not let him go and just say, just, just stay with us to the end of the season. You know, I, um, you know, the fact that we've obviously, Simpsons going at the end of the season to Rangers, for example, well, I'd be quite happy for him to, join him now on loan until he goes there. Don't really yeah. seem uh, that beneficial to keep Jack Simpson around. Yet we're letting Gosling go now. Uh, yeah, um, that that worries me a little bit because I think we we need them sort of characters around at the moment. So the timing of it is is odd. And the whole thing's a little bit odd, isn't it? In that he was he was looking to move maybe to, to Forest. He turned down that. He made a very public statement that he wanted to stay and fight. And then he's gone. Neil, what do you make of that? Is that... Is that a money well, thing? What is that? His, his face hasn't fitted this year, that's for sure. So I, I think um, there's a, there was a group of players that were very much Eddie's uh, Eddie's players. Um, so, you know, Andrew Sermon, we had the, the bit at the start of the season where Andrew Sermon came out and said he was let go without anyone speaking to him after all of his years of service to the club. And then the club... PR team got hold of that and started rushing out statements left, right, and centre, saying what you know, what a lovely chat they'd had, and you know. It, but obviously, it you know, there, there was um, you know, Frano uh, Sermon, um, Charlie Daniels, Mark Pugh, Dan Gosling were very much uh, you know loyal to Eddie, Eddie's players, and I think potentially Jason wanted to stamp his own mark on the team, but he, he's it's come back to bite him because all of those players may not be as talented as the players that um, have replaced them, but every single one of them, you know, I was thinking about Mark Pugh, Diego Rico rightly got a hammering on, uh, on for his performance, but Dan Juma didn't track back once. So Diego Rico was facing two players at every time. If De Diego Rico had Mark Pugh in front of him, he'd have, he'd have looked a decent left back because he coped fine with the um, top league in Spain. Uh, Lloyd Kelly was a brilliant left back at Bristol City and Bristol City fans said we were lucky to get him uh, at, at championship level. 
but again, he's looked awful. But there's never ever been anyone covering in front of them or dropping behind them or doing anything like that. They are completely and utterly exposed to ever plays at left back at this club. <laughs> And, uh, and and I just think that's the you know that that's the issue. And in, in Dan Gosling, um, you could just see he featured far less in the Championship than he ever did in the Premier League. Jason just didn't fancy him. Um, but the but that's fair enough. Managers have got to make those decisions. The the the, the bizarre thing about all of this is that a promotion rival wants them because they think he will strengthen them, and we've let that happen. And that and that is just that's just madness because. You know, he's only got to score one goal or two goals that make the difference in points and we'll be regretting that forever. And if he if he's in their side, he'll grab a goal. I think Neil's Neil's right as well. And I understand the the thought of um Jason trying to, you know, stamp his authority and kind of get his own team together. I, I do get that. But I would have thought that he'd think, you know what, I need the people I can rely on around here for this season. And then if we bounce back at the first attempt and then he goes Daniels, time to move on. Gosling, time to move on. Then I would kind of go, you know what? He's trying to create his own team now. I respect that. They've done the job to get us back up. But to do it during and at the start of a championship campaign that we really need them sort of players, that's what what um, confuses me, definitely. And, and as we all say, to strengthen Watford. I mean, there's a reason why Watford, who are above us, want Dan Gosling. There, there's a reason for it. I mean, people saying, well, he won't get in our team anyway. Well, Watford want him. You know, Watford want him. And I, I probably think, what Watford think, you know what? He's a bit of experience that can come on in games, can really help us, you know, bring on an extra man in midfield to see out a game or his energy and stuff like that. Why we're not thinking that, I don't know. Yeah, the, um, the, the problem we've got, I think, is the team is not enjoying playing football. Mm. We're, we're not. You can see it. There's there's no real camaraderie, and you see a lot of these PR shots that come out. People, you know, players laughing in training, and I'm sorry, I don't believe it. I think there's some deep problem in the team. Cliques, players not getting on with each other, players not talking to each other. You know, they're partly. I think it is players wanting to be somewhere else as well, and and it what happens is they're all playing as individuals they don't they don't give a monkeys about anyone else on the pitch it looks like you know they don't they don't track back he could do but they don't they could if care about it if they lose the ball in midfield and you know fight for it they don't seem to be doing that and i think it's deeper it's like a it's like a you know i'm not really that bothered i'll find another club and it will be better or i don't like these players you know maybe the spanish players are a little bit of a clique Maybe there's something else going on there, you know, that that we're just not privy to. But it doesn't look like a happy ship at all. It's also a very large ship now as well. So you look at squads that tend to bond and do well. They're quite tight knit squads. Um, and I mean, look at the central midfielders we've got now with um, uh, Bob for staying as uh, as well. Um, uh, I mean, with Gosling going, you know, that slightly eases that problem. But it, but there's just so many players. I mean, who? Who on earth is going to play centre of midfield in the next game? Because people are saying, well, Wilshire should start um, and Pearson should start. So that's that's fine. So then you've got Cook, Lerma and Billing. You've got one to pick out of those three. And then you've got the other two to try and keep happy. So it's it's a large, it's a large bloated squad, which I don't think helps with, uh, you know, with, you, Rick Helmy's probably thinking, why did I come? Um, he, he, he never gets a look in. Uh, if Matt Ritchie comes back, you know, there's even less of a looking for, you know, that's Stanislas or Brooks not starting. Uh, you just think that we didn't need to necessarily bring all these players in. We just needed to make the ones that we had that were good enough fit a system and work. I'm glad you mentioned Richie there, uh, Neil. Just want to get some kind of thoughts on him. If, if he possibly is looking maybe to, to come back to us, Richie to Bournemouth, is, what's he going to bring? Is he going to bring what we're looking for? I mean, we're not going to be getting the same player, Tom, that, that left us, are we, really? We're not going to get the same player. Um, I think if he, I mean, since he's been at Newcastle, he seems to have adapted into a left-back, left-wing-back role. Um, so if he were to come back here, we're not getting the Richie we let go. I think we would get someone who we try and play at left-back or left-wing-back mm -hmm. because that is an area we could probably do with strengthening. So I think that's where he would come in. Um, so, yeah, we wouldn't get the same player, but we would get someone who's, um, gained experience since leaving us, um, always been brilliant in the championship. And to be honest, he would get in now, whether it be left back or left wing back. Um, so, yeah, I would, I would certainly be be happy with Richie coming in. I'm 
obviously it, it's still it's almost counteractive you try to bring someone in who's been um really good for us over the years you know um good relationship with the fans you know gives his all stuff like that while getting rid of Dan Goslin, who does all of them things as well. It seems a bit odd, but maybe if, if he's looking to bring him in at left back, left wing back, we probably could do with an upgrade there because Diego, I, I agree with what Neil said as well. Dan Juma certainly didn't help him the other night, but um, Lloyd Kelly, he doesn't seem like he wants him to play as a fullback. Uh, Diego Rico hasn't performed consistently and I don't like having Adam Smith out there because of the balance. So yeah, we could probably do with, with someone else out there. So I'd be... Happy with that. I suppose the letting Gosling go makes me think that's probably a goer just to try and ease some wages up and things like that because it sounded like in the in the summer that was what was the kind of stumbling block. But um, I will be more than happy to have Matt Ritchie back. I don't think it's the sort of signing that will potentially make us that bit. Do you know what I mean? I think it's, it'll be a good one for the squad and I think he'll always put a shift in and be a good player for us. But um, I'd like to see us make a statement and maybe, like Neil said, try and get someone in that can go up alongside Dom or, or compete with Dom a little bit, but um, we're running out of time, so I'm not so sure about that one. Can I can I also just make a point about the younger players at the club? Because back in the autumn, it felt like the younger players were being given a chance. They were on the bench, you know, crikey, we gave a 16-year-old a, a debut for, off the bench, didn't we? And suddenly, that, all, that whole sort of uh, commitment to youth Seem, we seem to have lost it off the boards going, who was promising midfielder who hasn't got any minutes at all. Um, Surridge, you, you're your man of the match against Barnsley, and yet you haven't been played since. What's that all about? Um, and we've got a promising left back, haven't we? An under 21. Nobody's talking about him. Why aren't we giving him a go? Because he would have done better than. Rico, or maybe doubled up with Rico to give us a bit more solidity on that side. And I, I just don't see where the younger players fit in. It seemed like there was a there was a plan you felt in the autumn, and it's unraveling, and that is what is worrying. I think it's a bit of panic. I think it's a bit of panic. We like you say when we were doing doing well. I mean, we all we were all saying on on shows like this that performances weren't great, but we were getting over the line, so we were getting the points. And uh, then it was, oh, we'll bring on a 16-year-old when we're 5-0 up. Um, we gave Kilkenny a go in the cup and it all looked quite promising. Jane Nantley come on a few times, Sam Surridge, like you say. Then when the results didn't come and it's almost like panic um, and just trying to get more experience in there, which once again seems to really counteract the whole Goslin thing as well. But that's, that's what it feels like. We didn't have any of them really um, in the squad uh, the other night. Um, but yeah, it seems like, we're, he's he's trying to look for people he could trust more, but then, like uh, like Neil alluded to, with the with the size of the squad as well, it means you almost over rotate. I think um, mm -hmm. you can make six changes from one game to the next, which sounds good. But then where's where's the kind of um, where's the relationships now? Where's that, that season where we won the league? We barely ever changed our team, mm -hmm. apart from Pittman and Kermigan. Literally, you could just name the team like that. They barely changed it at all. And obviously injuries help with that if you keep them fit and fresh. But like, like we, we mentioned earlier, sometimes having a tight-knit group, and I almost feel like with the size of the squad and trying to keep everyone happy potentially, we're almost over-rotating. And I could see six, seven changes for, for Tuesday. Do you know what I mean? And that's, I feel like that's that's too much. And he, I don't, and Jason certainly doesn't know his best team. And that, that could be an issue sometimes, I think. And he's got a massive problem if he brings Richie back, because I think you're right, Tom. If he brings him back, he's got him as a wing back in mind. If he plays a wing back, he, he's either going to play 3-4-3, three, three, which means there's two central midfielders. So we've already said which three of the four, four or five would you pick. We'd, you'd now be down to which two of those would you pick, um, which is, you know, a ridiculous situation. Or he plays 3-5-2 which means he brings uh, Surridge or King up front, which means you can't play Brooks or Stanislas. So, you know, that five at the back is not the system you want. So, Matt, to me, Matt Ritchie has to come back as a wide one in a four or not come back. And I think we're, what we're doing is that classic thing when something's failing is they're all throwing money at the problem now to try and get it. So, you know, the wages of Wiltshire, Pearson, Ritchie and Jonathan Woodgate, if he if he comes in, that, that's a huge amount of cash we've thrown at a failing manager who didn't need any of those four people. Is that giving well, that him as well. the rope Sorry, to hang himself, do you think? Sorry. I was going to say, is, is that giving Tyndall the rope to hang himself, do you think, Neil? Do you think he's 
no. you know, essentially. Neil Blake, Neil Blake and Jason Tindall are massive mates. He's not giving him rope to hang himself. He's trying to prop up a really crap decision, in my opinion. I like Jason. I want him to succeed. I think we all want him to succeed. And where where the problem is, is he talks a great game, but it's that connection with the players is what's missing. And the it's the dynamic within the team, the, the, the dynamic of the players with the manager and the coaching staff. I mean, what what Jonathan Woodgate brings is going to be interesting because, you know, he failed at Middlesbrough and uh, I'm not sure what it's like, not sure what reviews there are of, of him out there that make you, make you full of confidence. I mean, that said, you know, we were delighted all when Graham Jones went, so... <laughs> It's 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 so much change. Can't give a head around it. He's trained under Pulis, hasn't he? So, uh... <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> what will that bring? I wonder. <laughs> no one, no, no one ever knows, and we'll never know. It was made me laugh because people online were saying, "Oh, some people were saying, oh, Graham Jones left, and look, we lost three one." And other other people were saying, "Thank God he's gone." And you think, well. None of us have got a clue what a third, no, what a what a coach exactly. brings to a football club. None of us have. So, um, uh, and and Jonathan Woodgate is a is an intelligent guy, and he's he's played some really good top level football. So, you think he would be all right, but it's another centre central defender. So, Jason Tindall's a defender. Stephen Purchase is a defender. Sean Cooper, who's moved up to work to the, with the first team, was a set, was a defender, and now Jonathan Woodgate's a defender. So, um, it's it. <laughs> It doesn't look to me like the most balanced setup of coaches you can put together. Yeah, and we can't score goals, so we get another defender. Yeah, not not looking great. Okay, so let's get the worst bit out of the way. I think what happens if this continues and and promotion is off the cards by March? You know, what's going to happen to this squad? Are we able to retain any of them, Tom? Um. I mean, we'd keep some, but to be honest with you, I think it's, I, I, I've said it as well, the worry is kind of, you know, if you don't achieve your goals, you're going to lose your players, but then you're losing the players that didn't help you achieve your goals. So is it that bad? Do, do you know what I mean? I think um, sometimes if we weren't to, you know, achieve promotion this season, yes, we'd lose a lot of players. Um, but I think that's the problem anyway. I think a lot, I think um, Jeff said it earlier, potentially these players think, well, regardless if I go up with Bournemouth, I'll probably get a Premier League team next year. So that that's that's the problem that there's no hunger there. But um, yeah, we'd certainly lose lose a lot of players if we weren't to go up. But then there'd be players that would have let us down. So um, is what it is. But in terms of if if we, you know, well away from it in in March, I'd like to think we won't be. Um, then that'll be a real decision because then it's kind of well, is it fair to get a new manager in who's not going to be able to to achieve anything this year, or do you get them in early and try and rebuild, um, or do you? You know, have a chat with Jason. Say right next year. I, I don't know, but the problem with with getting uh, relegated from the Premier League, you, you need to get back from that first attempt because of the parachute payments and things like that. And I think if we weren't to get promoted this season, you're looking at teams like um, like your Huddersfields and teams like that who are going through a transition now because they didn't bounce back at the first attempt. So now they've got to settle for kind of mid table at best in the Championship and try and keep there to rebuild to try and go up again. So it's all lists, buts, and maybes at the moment. But the fact is, the reason why it's difficult to, to swing too many positives on it at the moment is because results ain't on the pitch and performance ain't on the pitch. Um, I always try to remain positive, regardless of things that were happening, because the results were coming. The results ain't coming at the moment, and that's why it's really, really difficult. And the fact of the matter is, we've got a week ahead. We've got to get six points. We've got to get six points. Somehow find a way of winning a couple of football matches on the bounce and hope that that springboard some sort of form. And uh, that's that's as far as we can look now, in my opinion. We've we've only got the uh, promotion season to look back on as what got us up last time, and hunger was a big part of it. We had lots of players with points to prove because they were used to playing at League One, League Two level, and you know Eddie had got them to a point where they believed they could go further. There were a few really good additions to that squad to strengthen it. Callum Wilson being one of them, but he had a point to prove back in back in those days too. You look at our squad now and the players that have come back down and I don't think there's enough of them who've got points to prove. And um, Josh King, I can't believe he stayed, actually. 
you know, because he he's where's his desire to prove a point? You know, he's waiting to the end of the season now. Um, Lerma and Billing, not sure they have points to prove necessarily. They probably both think they should be in the Premier League anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, David Brooks, Welsh international, you know, he, the point he's got to prove is that he's actually the player he once was. And the second half that he put in the other day, I thought was excellent compared to what he's been like. But it's still, it's not the Brooks that we know or we used to see regularly. You know, he seems to have lost his confidence when he's got a, an opportunity to shoot. He's, he hasn't scored for, well, for a long time. And the chances that he's had, he should be putting away. He's good enough, but he's not been doing that. Um, he's giving the ball away. So he's got a point to prove, you'd think. Or are they just thinking, well, we'll wait until the end of the season and get picked up if we do go down mm-hmm. or stay down, rather? If you're, if you're a full international and you've got an agent, then... You, you, a move is guaranteed for you. So um, Diego Rico would, would go back to, you know, a newly promoted Spanish club and be a decent left back for him. Jefferson Lerma would have a hit, host of clubs and Ch- and the option of China, like all um, South American internationals have always got the options and links with China. If he wants to go and do a big payday for his family, for the future, um, you know, Josh King, Brooks, they'll, they'll all, they could all go. And that, that's the difference. Whereas, Nobody wanted Frano or Mark Pugh. And even when they were in the Premier League, nobody wanted them. <laughs> so, and, you know, had we gone down in the first season, um, no one would have come in. No Premier League clubs would have come in for 80% of our squad. Probably Callum Wilson, you know, and that would have been it. No, no, none of them. Would, so they all had to keep going and going and going. You could see it with that Reading player who did, did that great double block uh, on the on the goal line. That's what we used to see from Tommy Elphick and, and players like that. He th- that poor lad threw himself twice at a moving ball. Um, and, and I watched, contrasted that with Jefferson Lerma, who we all know is a hard man. And he's like, he's switching off, not tracking back, you know, all, all those sort of things. But that, a manager is the person that's got to get hold of you and say, that's not acceptable, you're not playing again. I said the other, night, thinking, uh, the other night, it felt like, I felt jealous watching Reading because it felt like that's what we were like when yeah. we went up. It was that um, so many players that were kind of playing with no fear, but um, also thinking, oh, we've got to put a shift here because these are better players than us. Uh, yeah. We've got, got to put our bodies on the line and things like that. And um, yeah, everyone's bang on. And, and, and just bang on what he says about the fact that that team that went up, we had a group of players that had something to prove. Um, and now we've got a group of players that probably feel like they're already proven. And that, that's, that's an issue. That's a problem. But like you say, that's where Jason's got to earn his money now. And that's where he's got to get the best out of these players. Yeah. Best managers get the best out of the players. Look at Eddie Howe. I mean, he just, the, he got the best out of every single player. And that's what we need now. And they've got, they've got to find a way. And like I say, no point looking too far ahead, but we've got to look at this. This is a big week and we've got to find a way of just getting a couple of wins and, and seeing where it takes us. But, um, Yes, it's it's difficult trying to remain upbeat with with what we what we've seen the last few weeks. It really is because um, you know, I like these group of players and I want to believe in them. But the the thing is, if they're not showing it on the pitch, what, we haven't got anything to go off. Um, so it's really really frustrating. But um, let's hope we see something in the next week anyway. JT's problem yeah. is does he have the depth of experience to manage yeah. this situation? Because it ain't easy. It's not an easy situation at all. And for a manager with um, so little experience of managing top players, bringing through young players, blending it all together to create a team that's dealing with the trauma of getting relegated. You know, that it's all yeah, and also he's 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 only really known Bournemouth all of his life, and this is a really really unusual situation for this football club. I I can only think of one other time when we had a squad that underperformed its quality because we've always been um, absolutely brassic, haven't we? And we've always had squads that either performed to their level and finished 18th or 16th or got relegated, or we've had managers that have been able to bring a squad above its level, um, you know, which Mel Machin, Sean O'Driscoll uh, and Eddie Howe all had periods of doing. Obviously, Eddie was the most notable one. But what we never have ever have had is like been that sort of, Derby County or West Ham, where everyone's like, how can they have all them players and not win many football matches? And that, so it's a really 
un bournemouth like position that we've got all these multi-million pound superstars and we're now getting bullied off pitches by teams that are worth a fraction of us that that used to be our role because reading reading are a good side i think lucas jow was fantastic wasn't he and the way he took that goal was just genius but a better example was derby county who um who will who did the same job as reading just without the quality and beat us one nil because they were also throwing themselves in in the way of everything um and uh you know so it's really weird because this is a complete role reversal for us as a football club it's what happens to manchester city every week and we are not manchester city (laughs) we're not we're not there is there is i've got to mention this because it has been mentioned on social media by a few of our friends our fans and i think it's worth just putting our our pennies in on this one there is a manager living locally who is out of a job and uh, he's twiddling his thumbs at home waiting for the phone to the ring to, you know, for the phone to ring would he would he third time or, or do you think that would be a bad move oh i thought you were talking about tony pulis <laughs> <laughs> very true what do you think jeff do you think he should or not if he was offered it not should saying he? he would be should he God, I don't know. Um, I think a lot probably went on at the club in the summer. And would he want to come back? Probably not. I mean, if if he's got an offer from Celtic on the table and one from Bournemouth, I think he'd probably do himself a favour and go to Celtic, actually. What would you say, Neil, if he if he turned up in that wonderful car park that we've got? <laughs> I'd be over the moon. I'd be over the moon because I never wanted him to go. And uh, but I think I think uh, Jeff's right. I mean, he it, he started by saying it was all positive. Everyone was going to sit down. We we're going to talk about next year. Then seven days later, he was gone. So I think uh, seven days later, sorry, he was gone. So I think there's the, you know we don't know what happened in that period. But I think that would have to be unpicked. I think he I think he'd come back because I think in his heart of hearts this is where this is where he wants to this is where he wants to be would be my my reading of it so i think he'd come back and i think he would he would quite quickly shape that team into a 4411 and uh and and get them performing so uh, and get us up so I, that would you know I, I would be i would be delighted i just i can't see it happening with all of the same people at the club that were there that couldn't resolve it in the summer correct yeah, there's a reason yeah. why. There's a reason why he's not here. There's a reason why he's not here, and uh, uh, the club know, you know, what the fans think of him, and the club know what a job he can do in the championship. So there's a reason why he's not here. So I can't see enough changing for him to come back anyway. I don't think it's really a question. But obviously, regardless of who the manager is and how they're doing, um, if Eddie Howe's available, I'll always want Eddie Howe. But um, at the moment, I mean, what's going to happen? Is he going to try and come back in and then say, Jason, could you come? Be my number two again. I mean, it'll just all be, yeah, it's not going to happen, but um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I just can't see it, unfortunately. This is this is a really dark time because we've we've been shocking the last six, seven games, but it's football, things change. Yeah. Tottenham fans were all for getting Mourinho out not so long ago, suddenly he's a genius and he's going to take him to the top of the table. Now he's not again, you know, it changes. Jason might turn it around and we might be sitting here at the end of the season saying, well, I never thought we'd go on a 20 game winning streak to end the season. I really hope that's true. Yeah, like we continue saying, but we have, you know, regardless of us, we have got the quality, we have got the squad. If if they start performing to their maximum levels, then we can go on a run. Um, You know, Jeff's right. I mean, it feels like it wasn't that long ago when Chelsea were going to win the league and Arsenal were going to get relegated. I think they're virtually level now and Lampard's not in a job. So it can all change. And um, that's that's the thing that and the quality that we've got makes you think that that's why I was saying about these next couple of games. No disrespect to the two teams because Sheffield Wednesday beat us at the end of the day. But these are two teams, probably if I had to hand pick them, that I thought even if we're not our best, we might just have a bit too much and bundle our way into a couple of wins without playing particularly well. And that can springboard something. Yeah. And, and that's that's what I'm hoping for. I'll be very surprised if we don't beat Sheffield Wednesday. Don't say that. No, I will be. <laughs> I will be. I'll be really surprised because uh, I think we we uh, I I just think it'll 
the players that go out there after the Reading game, uh, I think they'll, he'll make changes. I think Wilshire will come in. I think Pearson will come in. I think I think Pearson is the sort of player that beds in quick. He's because he's a grafter. Um, and and I'll be I'll be really surprised if we don't beat Sheffield Wednesday. My worry is less about will we win games in the next five or six games. My worry is more more about how has have we got enough in the coaching squad to um, to see off the be- the better teams and go through the playoffs if we have to do that by seeing off the better teams. And I don't think we have, and that that's more my worry. So this is a really pivotal month. I feel like I say that every month. In terms of fixtures we got now, we've got Wednesday, Birmingham, Forest, Rotherham, QPR, Cardiff and Watford. <sighs> Happy Valentine's Day, Jeff, uh, in that month. What, <laughs> what kind of points total do we need to be getting here? I mean... <sighs> 16, I'd say. Because okay. you've, got to, you've got to be able to beat all those teams going into the Watford game. They're, you know, they're all beatable. We beat, we've beaten most of them already this season. We should have beaten Rotherham. So, quite honestly, that's a that's a pretty decent run we've got up until that Watford game, and then you know we're at home. We, mm. we there's nothing to be afraid of with Watford. We've we've seen what they like. We know what they like. We know we know what's coming. the The challenge will be whether we get bullied by them or by any of those other teams in in the interim because they've seen what what beats us and it's it's kicking us it's disrupting us it's not getting Solanke into the game and it's by being more energetic than us and if they do that we know we could easily drop points but it's up to the boys to turn it around isn't it it seems mad saying like six six wins in a row on current form but if you take all them games in isolation you go well we should beat them we should be and that's that's the point I think um a concerning thing is I, I spoke to a, a Reading fan uh, prior to the game, who I spoke to prior to the game before, and um, he said that the, the manager and that kind of said how they've got a different plan this time because last time they felt they were maybe a little bit naive, you know, in that second half against us, and they've seen how teams have got results against us, and they're going to use that to. That's it's it feels a little bit like that at the moment. Teams know they know they know what to do, um, so that's a worry. But yeah, like I say, taking them games in isolation, we. We should be able to win. About, I mean, I'd like to think we can we can win at least five of the next six, but um, oh, I don't know. We'll see. Game we're, still not, we're still not scoring goals, actually, and I think Solanke, playing the way we're playing, does not help him because mm. he's getting beaten up by the centre-halves every time they play the ball into him as a target man. He needs help up there. Mm-hmm. And he's not a fox-in-the-box sort of striker, so, you know... It's difficult for him to get into the game and get his confidence back to get scoring. I really think Sam Sorridge has been underused. I'd love to see love to see him playing two up front, whether that's Solanke and King, Solanke and Sorridge, Sorridge and King, maybe. You know, give Solanke a break because he doesn't look like he's going to score at the moment and we need him to. Yeah, I think he's a streaky player, Solanke. He's always, and uh, he... he... He had a, you know, he looked poor, and then he he looked excellent, and now he looks poor again. So I think he, if you are a streaky player, you do need to have someone that comes in for you, uh, and then you need to come on and score a goal, and then that brings you back into the side, doesn't it? So I think the biggest the biggest concern is, um, you know, in isolation, Tom's right, we can win all those games, but we've won eleven out of twenty six games this season with the best squad in the in the league. And that's the, you know, that's that's kind of what, what it boils down to, to me, is that how, how can you have a squad that good and only win 11 out of 26 games? So that that, that that there's got to have to be a dramatic shift or change in, in what we do. And I think we've got to, if you were mentoring Jason, you'd just say, settle on a system, settle on, settle on a group of players, take them to one side. Uh, put 16 or 17 on a training pitch, get the others off training somewhere else, just concentrate on that 16 or 17 and tell tell them this is the formation we're playing and we're going to play this for the next five games, whether we win or not. And j- just to bed in to the fact that they're not having to get used constantly to a different system every game. Um, because God forbid if we're changing our system to, to, to match up against the likes of Coventry and people like that, because we shouldn't be. Liverpool don't. They just go out and play the same way every week. And we, we should be doing that in this league with the players we've got. 
that's my worry, I think, with in terms of like going on a run and things like that is, as we alluded to earlier, with the size of the squad, I thought the problem is we're going to end up over-rotating, changing system constantly to get different players in and we're going to we're gonna win a game and then we're going to go, right, we'll make four changes here. Then we might draw again. We'll go, right, we'll make six changes here and we'll change it to a three. And it's it's too much. It's, it's too much. Yeah. I think we're just over... And it is... And does that boil down to the fact of how big the squad is and trying to keep everyone happy? I think... I, I agree exactly what Neil was saying. And and all we can look at is when we got promoted the first time, it was we had a system, we had the same players. We can, you've got to have that about you. And that that's my concern with the amount of games you have as well. I mean, we're virtually playing two games a week, aren't we, at the moment? So there's always going to be that temptation. And the problem is, with that temptation, Jason knows we've got quality not playing. So yeah. he thinks... Oh, it's easy. I'll just make seven changes. Yeah, but it's really difficult to then get a run together when you yeah. over rotate like that. I think so. Um, be interesting to see see what we do if we go and win three 0 on Tuesday. Does he then continue with that, or has he almost already got his plan in head for the weekend of who he's going to change? So we'll see. It strikes me. I, you talk about kind of history repeating itself. We talk about our championship squad, but this reminds me of a time a long time ago now, about twenty years ago, when we got relegated uh, under Sean O'Driscoll. And uh, Peter Phillips gave O'Driscoll a six-game ultimatum. He had six games to turn it around. And it, it feels, to me, it feels like we're in that kind of situation now. Hmm. I hope I won't cry like a little baby like I did then, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember that. Yeah, the cry. Did you cry what? Cry because of the relegation or cry because O'Driscoll went? A bit of both, I think. I right. um, The first manager I really remember was Mel Machin. But when I... When I first started proper watching football, you know, and I was that little bit older, I was it was always O'Driscoll. So I think he was almost like I couldn't imagine Bournemouth when without him and stuff like that. But yeah, I remember that relegation and that was that was really, really difficult. Um when we came down from the championship last time, Neil will remember this. I mean we had a squad that was too good for division one and we yeah. didn't bounce back and, and that sort of started a rot in that squad. And and that's what I'm really worried about that you know, if if we don't go back up this year, it's, the, it's going to be really tough for us. The bigger worry, if you draw that parallel, because I think you're right in drawing that parallel, was not so much the rot on the playing side setting, but the rot on the financial side. Financials, and, absolutely. And this, is, this is my worry of, because back in those days, we kept players like uh, Luther Blissett and, you know, Sean Till. They're all on massive wages in crowds of 4,000. And that sparked the whole financial crisis that then rumbled on for 15 years and that that was all this was always my con concern about making sure we had a proven manager for this year was we 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 not to allow that mistake to happen again because and um, we're now compounding it with the wages of jack wiltshire and you know i'm sure ben pearson's ben pearson's come for a reason we paid players a lot of money i mean the reason why dan gosling didn't go to forest will be they didn't match what he was on and watford are that that you know i don't think he really wanted to stay and fight for his place i think he'd given up on that um so we pay players a lot of money and that's the that's my worry um the parallel with that season is we, we, we'll end up with people won't want these players if they don't go up that because because none of them have played well scouts coming to watch Josh King will not be seeing the Josh King that scored 17 goals in the Premier League. Um, there's much, we've seen far better players in the opposition that are worth a hundred grand than Josh King's played for us this year. So that, you know, we've got, we've got to sort it out because otherwise we could face the same financial disaster. And that worries me more than the playing side because playing teams always go in cycles. Yeah, definitely. I can cope with players leaving with, Go, getting relegated, being in whatever division you want, you know, whatever players we've got on that pitch, my worry is financially if we don't bounce back. That's and that's what I've said. I'll, I'll be more than happy to go back next season in the championship, enjoy some away days, hopefully, yeah. and see what group of players we've got. You know, but we're Bournemouth fans. We're not demanded. Do you know what I mean? Um, we we know we'll we'll be there. Whatever. My my worry is the financial side of it. We're not a massive football club. We're a tidy football club that have got players on massive wages. Um, so that's definitely my concern and that's why I worry is there a bit of panicking going on everywhere people don't really know what to do because there is that panic of we need to get straight back up and we're in a rut at the moment um, so yeah that's that's the concern that's the concern okay well let's finish this on a bit of an up or at least try to if we go around maybe a score prediction for the next game then against Wednesday I'll start with you Tom what do you think is going to happen 5-0 win come on Oh, I love we're it. Bounce back because that nowhere, and we're just going to put them to the sword. Um, yeah, uh, like I think Neil said earlier, I still think 
we should. I mean, I'll be very, regardless of form, be very surprised if we don't beat Sheffield Wednesday and there isn't some sort of reaction and a few changes and things like that. And I think Wilshire will start. I think we'll open up a bit more. But yeah, just to try and, because it's been a difficult one, I'm just going to go even more positive and say we're going to hit five. Five nil. Brilliant. Jeff, what are you feeling? I'd really like to be in that five nil boat with you, Tom. I just think it's going to be a little bit more edgy. I think we'll make it probably one nil or two one. One nil. There you go. And nil. What do you think? I think, I think we'll win three one. Would be my take. I think we'll concede. Um, we might. Um, we might even concede first, and uh, just to set the whole Twitter world on fire, <laughs> and then uh, and then come back and uh, and score. I think we'll win. I think if we don't win, then we really, really need to look at things. If we don't win and don't play well, then we really need to look at things. But I think we will. Yeah. Yeah. The, these next two games, it's it's Sheffield Wednesday and Birmingham, both winnable. We've got to get six points, uh, and then we can you know let our hair down and play Burnley in the cup, can't we? Don't say let our hair down when Neil next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All me to be well, fair. Say, you're not exactly going to pull it yourself, Tom. That's true. <laughs> if we concede first, I'm going to have to hide, I think, off Twitter for a bit. <laughs> yeah, you probably do, Tom. You probably do. Well, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for your company today. Jeff, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Tiggs. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. Cheers, Tiggs. And Neil, no doubt see you soon. Yeah, will do. See you later. And to you at home, thank you for watching. On Tuesday night, we are back in action. Uh, we've got the free-for-all after the Sheffield Wednesday game. So make sure you join us for some raw reaction. Hopefully lots of smiles uh, if we can. But until then, up the cherries. See you in the next video. <laughs>